Hello everyone. I hope you are enjoying our sessions by such stellar leaders from the world of work at the ETHR World Human Capital Experience APAC Summit. Well, it's time to move on to our next keynote session of the day on the topic, the four stages of building psychological safety at work. Psychological safety is a condition in which human beings feel included, safe to learn, safe to contribute, and safe to challenge the status quo, all without fear of being embarrassed, marginalized, or punished in some way. The four stages of psychological safety are a universal pattern that reflects the natural progressions of human needs in social settings. When teams, organizations, and social units of all kinds progress through the four stages, they create deeply inclusive environments, accelerate learning, increase contribution, and stimulate innovation. To share some valuable insights on such an important and interesting topic, I have the pleasure of welcoming the brain and heart behind this theory. Please join me in welcoming Timothy R. Clark, author of the book, The Four Stages of Psychological Safety. Timothy is the founder and CEO of Leader Factor, a global consulting, training, and assessment organization that focuses on leadership, culture, and change. Dr. Clark is an international authority in the field of psychological safety and innovation, large-scale change and transformation, and senior leadership development. He has personally worked with more than 200 executive teams around the world. Dr. Clark is the author of five books, including his new bestseller, The Four Stages of Psychological Safety, Defining the Path to Inclusion and Innovation. He has also written more than 200 articles for publications such as the Harvard Business Review, Forbes, and Fast Company. His mantra for leaders is, lead as you have no power. Welcome, Tim, and thank you so much for joining us today. So without any further ado, I would like to hand over the screen over to you, Tim. Hi, everyone. I'm Tim Clark, and I appreciate the opportunity to join you for the ETHR World Human Capital Experience APAC Summit. I am delighted to uh, be with you today, and I appreciate the opportunity to spend a few minutes with you. And I hope that you will take away from this session some insights and also some tools that you'll be able to apply Im immediately for, for value and impact in, in your role, in the, in the context in which you are working and contributing. So I'm gonna take some, I'm, a, I'm going to draw some uh, on some tools and concepts from my recent book, The Four Stages of Psychological Safety. We're gonna focus on psychological safety and some related concepts. So here we go. So here's the premise for our session today. You are a cultural architect. Now think about that for a minute. You may have not framed your role that way. You, you perhaps haven't seen yourself this way. And maybe you're saying, well, who me? I'm, I'm an individual contributor or I'm on a technical track or I'm recently hired. May I suggest that you're a cultural architect regardless of your role. It's embedded in your role. The reason is you radiate influence based on the values and the norms that you model every day. And there's no off switch. You can't come to work tomorrow and say, I don't want to be a cultural architect. I'm going to take the day off and then I'll come back the next day and do it. That's not how it works. You are a cultural architect by virtue of your modeling behavior. So the choice is this, when it comes to creating a culture, we all have a choice. Every organization has a choice. The choice is you can do it by design or you can do it by default. Regardless of the approach you take, in the end, you get a culture. So the choice is not about getting a culture. You will have a culture. Every organization, every team on the planet has a culture. The choice is, what approach you take. So do you do it by design or by default? Now think about the risks. Think about the potential unintended consequences of approaching culture by default. As we move into the 2020s, this decade of culture, it's increasingly becoming an intolerable risk to approach culture by default. I want you to think about that as, as we spend a few minutes together. So if we, if we say we're, gonna, we're going to approach it by design, what are we after? What are we trying to accomplish then? Well, I think we have at least 
a couple of shared goals or aspirations. This is how I would frame those. We're trying to create a sanctuary of inclusion. And second, we're trying to create an incubator of innovation. I think this is the irreducible minimum. Now, you might add characteristics of your culture based on your strategy, based on your context, based on your objectives. Fine. But I think we have these two shared goals in common. So how do you accomplish these goals? Well, this leads us to the concept of psychological safety. What is this concept? It's been around for a while, but since the pandemic began two years ago, the interest in psychological safety has exploded worldwide. Let's think about why that is. Let's define this concept. Here's what, here's what psychological safety means. We can define it in five words, an environment of rewarded vulnerability. This is the essence of the concept, an environment of rewarded vulnerability. Now think about that for a minute. The premise of the concept of psychological safety is this, human interaction is a vulnerable activity. Whenever we get together and interact, and furthermore, you really can't be yourself. You really can't learn or contribute or innovate without engaging in vulnerable activity. So the question is, will that vulnerable activity be rewarded or punished? The answer to that question makes all the difference when it comes to the performance of individuals and teams and organizations. Here's what we do. We go into a social situation and we immediately begin to engage in threat detection. It's normal, it's natural, it's instinctive. We're trying to figure out if we're in a safe or an unsafe environment. And so if we come to the conclusion that we're in a safe environment, we will typically offer a performance response. What does that look like? It means you're jumping in, you're eager to participate. You want to contribute and create value. And you feel that you can. You feel that you can release your discretionary efforts. On the other hand, if you think you're in an unsafe environment, you will typically offer a, a fear response. And a fear response is different. The objective of a fear response is not to create value, it's to survive. It's very different. You need to be able to ask and answer that question so that you can be guided by your answer. Your answer will govern your behavior. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about a fear response. When you're on the receiving end of punished vulnerability, what happens? Well, there's a few things that happen that we know based on research. Number one, it activates the pain centers of the brain. You process punished vulnerability in a way, neurologically, in a way similar to processing physical pain. Number two, it triggers the self-censoring instinct. Now you'll change your behavior. You'll change what you say and what you do. And that makes sense because you're an adaptable creature and you're, try you're trying to protect yourself. And then it's going to shift you into a defensive mode of performance. And now what are you gonna worry about? Managing personal risk, preserving yourself, avoiding loss. This is what we do when we are on the receiving end of punished vulnerability. Well, let's talk about, let's take it a step further. What are some acts of vulnerability? Common, everyday acts of vulnerability that we engage in as we work together every day. There are many showing up greeting someone, asking a question, asking for help, saying you don't know, apologizing, giving and receiving feedback. It goes on and on and on. Challenging the status quo, uh, registering an alternative point of view. We, we could create a master list and we could go on and on and on. What we're saying is, in order to be your authentic, complete self, and in order to really perform at capacity, 
You need those acts of vulnerability rewarded, not punished. That makes all the difference. So if we reduce this, if we distill this all the way down, here's what we come to. To change or transform culture comes down to a central mechanism, and that mechanism is to model and reward acts of vulnerability. This is the core skill, cultural skill for the 2020s. And there's no workaround, there's no shortcut, there's no back door. There's nothing can, that can substitute for not doing this. This is, the, this, this is the core mechanism for cultural transformation. Okay, well, let's, let's go a little deeper into the research. What we have discovered based on global survey research is that there's a pattern in the way psychological safety increases on a team or in an organization. So I'm going to actually pull out my highlighter here and I'm gonna kind of take you through this. So psychological safety in the first place is a function of two things. Number one, respect, which you see here on the vertical axis. And then number two, permission, which you see here on the horizontal axis. So it's the combination of those two things that gives us a level of psychological safety. Now, that could be high, it could be low, it could be somewhere in the middle. Beyond that, there is a progression through four successive stages. Let me take you through this very briefly. When we put people together in the first place, they're in a state of exclusion. Do you see this down in the lower left-hand corner? They don't know each other. They've never worked together before. By definition, they're in a state of exclusion. But as they begin to interact, patterns emerge. We call those patterns norms. If those norms are inclusive, then we move to the first stage of psychological safety, which is inclusion safety. We cross this threshold of, in, of, of inclusion and we move to stage one. Inclusion safety means that you feel included, you feel accepted. You feel a sense of belonging and connection. This is the foundation and the governing principle of human interaction to feel those things and to be able to interact safely. Then we go to stage two. Stage two is learner safety. It means that you can engage in the learning process without fear of being embarrassed or marginalized or punished in some way. That's stage two. Then we go to stage three, contributor safety. Contributor safety means that you're given an opportunity to make a meaningful contribution. That translates into an appropriate level of autonomy, role clarity, and then you have the guidance and support you need. That's stage three. And as you're moving through the stages, you are following the sequence of satisfying basic human needs. This is the sequence that we've discovered based on global survey research. Then finally, you arrive at stage four, challenger safety. This is the culminating stage. It means that you feel safe to challenge the status quo without what? Can you finish my sentence? Without retaliation, without retribution, without jeopardizing your personal standing or reputation, without putting your career on the line. You're gonna cross this innovation threshold to get to stage four. Why is there an innovation threshold? Because this entire area of stage four this is where we innovate. Innovation by its very nature requires that we disrupt the status quo. It requires challenging behavior. Otherwise, we can't create new solutions and solve problems and make breakthroughs. This is, this is an, an overall very quick outline of the four stages. So what's the goal? The goal is to move your team, every team, safely and successfully through the stages all the way to stage four and then sustain those conditions and not fall into the failure pattern of paternalism where we're 
unnecessarily micromanaging people or exploitation where we're trying to extract value from people without valuing them as human beings. So this is the framework of the four stages. It's a universal empirical pattern that cuts through demographics, cuts through psychographics, cuts, cuts through cultural attributes. Let's take a little closer look at each stage real quick. Stage one is inclusion safety. Here's the full definition. Inclusion safety satisfies the basic human need to be included, accepted, and belong. It means it's not expensive to be yourself. You're accepted for who you are, including your unique attributes and defining characteristics. Let me give you an example. So early in my life, I grew up in Southern Colorado in the United States. Among the Navajo, this is a Native American tribe, the second largest tribe next to the Cherokee. My father was a teacher among the Navajo. So I grew up with the Navajo and I experienced stage one inclusion safety. In spite of the, the significant differences that we had in culture and customs and mores and traditions and beliefs, they invited us into their society and we invited them into our society. And we were able to navigate the differences very, very successfully because we kept that foundation of inclusion safety in place, the respect and the permission. And so we learned how this works. Let me summarize stage one. Inclusion safety, this is the foundation, is a human right. It's not something you earn. It's owed to you. It's an entitlement. If you're human and you do not present the team with harm, I am morally obligated to include you. So we can say it this way, including another human being should be an act of prejudgment. I don't need to think about it in advance because it's based on your worth as a human being. It's not an act of judgment based on your worthiness. This is not about worthiness. This is about applying a worth test to each other based on humanity, not a worthiness test. When we get that mixed up, we sow the seeds of division. But when we apply a worth test, we can create and sustain a deeply inclusive environment. So that's stage one. Let's go to stage two briefly. Do I feel safe to learn? Here's the full definition. Learner safety satisfies the basic human need to learn and grow. You feel safe in the learning process, asking questions, giving and receiving feedback, experimenting, even making mistakes. And you'll be rewarded for those acts of learning vulnerability. Here's what we know about learning. Learning is both intellectual and emotional. You cannot separate, in the learning process, you cannot separate the thinking brain from the feeling brain. You cannot pull them apart. And so it's so essential that we nurture learner safety by rewarding acts of learning vulnerability, starting with asking a question and all other uh, forms of, of, of learning vulnerability that we engage in. Here's what we know based on the research. An emotionally bruised learner, how do you become emotionally bruised as a learner, by the way? when you have your acts of learning vulnerability consistently punished. What does that do to you over time? It bruises you emotionally, and then you become cognitively impaired as a learner. You cannot learn at capacity. On the other hand, if your acts of learning vulnerability are consistently rewarded, you become emotionally empowered and you are now cognitively enabled as a learner. Do you see the difference? The difference is profound. So we need teams and organizations that are consistently rewarding acts of learning vulnerability. That's stage two. Now let's go to stage three, contributor safety. 
Contributor safety satisfies the basic human need for autonomy and contribution. You feel safe and are given the opportunity and role clarity to use your skills and abilities to make a difference. So let's talk a little bit about the social exchange that happens with stage three. It's different than stage one. Stage one, as you'll recall, is a human right. Inclusion safety is a human right. By the time you get to stage three, we're not talking about human rights anymore. You have to earn the autonomy through results. So the team gives you autonomy in exchange for your results. Autonomy is not free. We're all accountable. Organizations are built on the principle of accountability, and that is as it should be. We're all accountable. We just, we need to understand that when we get to stage three, we have to earn that autonomy through demonstrated track record of performance. So that's stage three. Then finally, we get to stage four. The culminating stage. This is where everything comes together and we see the fullest expression of psychological safety. Here's the definition. Challenger safety, stage four, satisfies the basic human need to make things better. You feel safe to speak up and challenge the status quo when you think there's a need or opportunity to improve. So if we're watching, if we're observing a team that is demonstrating stage four challenger safety, what do we see? What patterns would we observe? Let me show you the patterns that we are, we are seeing as we work with teams around the world. When you get to stage four, you see cultural flatness. Yes, there's still a hierarchy, but we're much more agnostic to title and position and authority. We can debate issues on their merits. We can create an idea meritocracy. So there's cultural flatness. There's constructive dissent. Dissent isn't merely tolerated. It's rewarded, it's expected. There's a very high tolerance for candor and there's creative abrasion. Ideas are colliding and rubbing against each other. This is what we see when we get to stage four. In teams that exhibit these patterns, they far outperform our expectations. Let's talk a little bit about the social exchange here. So what does it look like? Well, the team gives you air cover for your, in exchange for your candor. You're gonna, you're going to be protected in those acts of challenging the status quo, okay? Now, one last thing that I wanna mention. There's a central defining characteristic for teams that get all the way to stage four challenger safety. And here's the, here's the pattern. They develop intellectual friction to extremely high levels. The intellectual friction is vital for innovation. This is the raw material to solve difficult problems, to create new solutions, to make breakthroughs, to innovate. You cannot do it without intellectual friction at a high level. But they keep the social friction at the, down at the same time. Why? Well, there's a tendency as the intellectual friction rises, the social friction will have a tendency to rise at the same time. Why? Because we're human. We get defensive. We're temperamental. We take things personally. We get territorial. That's the problem though, because the social friction at some point will shut down the intellectual friction. So we need to maintain the respect and the permission, which is the basis, right? It's, it's the very definition of psychological safety. If you can do that, you will achieve the highest level of performance as a team. So I want you to think about this, and I hope that our time together has shaken loose some insights. I'm going to leave you with one parting thought to kind of summarize. The single most important factor in creating psychological safety is your modeling behavior. Remember, you either lead the way or get in the way. You can't be a neutral party. 
when it comes to psychological safety. Now, that's a sobering thought, but it's also a very exciting thought because your influence as a cultural architect is vitally important to your team. So I hope that you'll reflect on what we've covered today, psychological safety and the framework of the four stages and your role as a cultural architect. And I appreciate very much the opportunity to be with you at this APAC summit. Thanks so much. What a wonderful session and such crisp insights coming in, Tim, from you. Thank you so much once again for joining us today. I will go back to Tim's own words where he said, the single most important factor in creating psychological safety is your modeling behavior. Remember, you either lead the way or get in the way. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, we conclude this session with Tim. I will request him to address our audience questions and you can reach out to him in case you have any further questions in your mind. Coming up next, our keynote closing session on the topic, Ritual Roadmap for Engaged Workforce with Erica Kiswain, author of the book, Rituals Roadmap, The Human Way to Transform Everyday Routines into Workplace Magic. See you on the other side.